We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report uh, with me on the Zoom, as it were, uh, Professor Dorothy Brown. She is a professor of law at Emory University and author of The Whiteness of Wealth, How the Tax System Impoverishes Black Americans. Uh, professor, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I, I was just saying this before we started to uh, record that um, I, I this is so uh, impressive and enlightening, I think. Um, particularly, we're in an era where there has been a, um, as the more I think that people uh, begin to become aware of our history of reconstruction, of the assaults on uh, black success, uh, yes. frankly, that took place during reconstruction, and then the subsequent um, uh, uh, institutional and governmental uh, roadblocks that were put up to uh, for black people to develop wealth in this country. I, I think there's a, a greater awareness of it. And to the point now where we hear, well, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, the subtext of this is that people are talking about reparations in a more serious uh, manner. We hear, well, there is no more systematic racism right. in our, uh, uh, in our uh, country. And, um, and, and frankly, I have been guilty of saying, well, there is systematic racism, but there isn't necessarily uh, the same level of institutional or governmental racism, but there is. And <laughs> your, your, your book makes that quite clear. And, you know, put aside um, the um, sort of the intent, although that's debatable, right. but even if we stipulate there is no intent, uh, uh, our government in the way that it deals, and I'm not talking about policing here because I think there's another story there too, specifically the tax uh, code. Yes. And um, tell the story of how you came to sort of like be aware of this. Because I, I found this sort of re revelatory and it is a, um, it is, it, it, it tells so much about the tax code, about the development of black wealth in this country, but it also tells a lot about what you can do with statistics and statistics that you do not pursue. But uh, start with your sort of, I guess, origin story. Yeah, so my origin story is I grew up in the South Bronx. I dealt with racism and I didn't want a job that forced me to deal with the substance of racism on my job. So I went into tax law because I thought tax law had absolutely nothing to do with race. As I like to say, the only color that was relevant was green. So I go into tax law and I'm doing my parents' tax returns like any good daughter, right? Who has an LLM in tax, I do my parents' tax returns. And I'm doing my returns and their returns and something's not adding up. I know what I'm doing, I'm doing everything right, but I should be paying a lot more in taxes than my parents because I by myself am making as much money as my parents combined. But that's not how it's working out and I cannot figure it out. But of course I have a job. So I finish the tax returns, I'm puzzled, but I go on to my da daily routine. Next April 15th, I come through the same roadblock. What is going on? It isn't until I become an academic and actually have time to step back and think that I start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. But it's not until I read an article, an article written by a then Duke law professor who was a mentor, who wrote an article that said, if you're a black law professor, you should write about how systemic racism impacts the area of law you teach. So I thought this would be an interesting article. I teach tax law. I assumed it had absolutely nothing to do with me, but this professor always made me think. So I read the article and a couple of pages from the end, it says, how do you know there isn't a race and tax problem if you don't look? And I went, what, race and tax? So I picked up the phone, I called him, I said, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna do something. No sooner did I say that than I discovered the IRS doesn't publish statistics by race. So I can just stop there. It never occurred to me to think about the IRS publishing statistics by race, but it's really hard to write about racially disparate impact of tax policy when the IRS doesn't publish right. statistics by race. All and these other government agencies do, but not the IRS. That's fascinating. How 
I mean, I don't want to go too far down that without getting into the to 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 the meat of the book, but 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 let's do. What like do you think that was a mistake, or I, just or was it just like you know there's a bunch of people there at the IRS who were like you were until you you saw this essay and were like, what possible relevance would that have? What the race is and to do racial breakdowns of how much what the effective tax rate is, what the actual tax rate is, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it was a conscious choice on the part of the treasury and the IRS to not publish statistics by race. And the reason I say that is there's research that shows there were decisions made to publish statistics by gender or age, but not by race. So I think it was conscious I think part of the reason why it was done was, well, if we don't have it, then you can't accuse us of discriminating on the basis of race. And in fact, several, like a, uh, over 10 years ago, maybe even further back, I was on a panel uh, talking about my race and tax work. And, and there was a person from the IRS there who said, I don't want to know. We don't want to know. It's really good that we don't have this information. So there's this idea that if you don't see it, it can't be discriminatory when really my research shows is just because you don't see it doesn't mean it isn't operating in a discriminatory manner. All right. And we're going to go through these things. Let me just say uh, that the best analogy I can do uh, relative to, to the work that you, you, you have done here, uh, without it being too much of a spoiler alert, but I think it, you, you've made it clear is, um, you know, for me personally, and I think uh, people in the audience have gone through this too, is sort of the uh, the understanding of the racial component of of Social Security, that when yes. uh, that like there was no explicit thing like we're not going to have uh, black people participate in Social Security, but there is a proxy, and that proxy is we're going to not include certain jobs right. that just happen to be dominated or, um, or, you know, widely populated by black people. And, right. and that sort of feels like the same dynamic that's going on here. You look at this, if you don't see the, the outcomes uh, as, uh, as div divvied up through race, then it wouldn't necessarily occur to you because you don't see that proxy. So let's, let's start with your parents. Like yes. why? Okay, so you have this mystery that your parents who combined make what you yes. make end up paying more in taxes. My understanding was always that like, if you're uh, married, then you, you get actually a tax save cut. in taxes. Right. Well, you do if you're a certain type of married couple. If you are a married couple where one spouse works in the paid labor market and the other spouse is a stay-at-home spouse, when that couple gets married, they get a tax cut. And that's how the joint return was designed to give single wage earner householders a tax cut. What my research shows looking at Census Bureau data is white married couples are more likely to be in single wage earner households, but not black married couples. Black married couples are likely to be my, my, like my parents. My mother was a nurse. My father was a plumber. They made roughly equal amounts. That household doesn't get a tax cut. And worse, for several decades, that household paid higher taxes when they got married. And this came out of, of what? There's a court case back in 1930. Tell us about that court case. Yes, yeah, so it was Henry and Charlotte Seaborn were one of the few white Americans back in, 19, in the late 1920s paying taxes. Because back then, our progressive tax system worked so that only the richest Americans pay taxes, but rich Americans don't like paying taxes. So the Seaborns thought of a way so that they could pay less taxes. And the way they did it was he worked and he had income and he tried to shift half of his income to his wife so that the last dollar of his income and her income would be taxed at a lower marginal tax rate than if he was taxed on 100% of it. Well, that wasn't what the tax law allowed. The tax law basically allowed us, required us to file as individuals. But the Seaborns go rogue with the help of their tax advisors and file, a retur file returns where half of his income 
is on his return and half is on hers. The IRS says, you can't do that. They go to court, it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Seaborns win. And they win because they're in a community property state where legally his spouse has a right to half of his income. So the Supreme Court says, if you're in a community property state, you can split your income. But if you're not in a community property state, you cannot. So we had a situation where dependent on where rich people lived would determine whether they could get a tax cut from using this technique. Well, Congress came to the rescue in 1948 with the joint return, which basically said it didn't matter what state you lived in, you could have your income split among your stay at home spouse and therefore cut your taxes. So just to be clear on what, what that means, if, if, if the threshold um, for, uh, for let's say, I mean, uh, I guess in 48, maybe in the 50s, it would have been uh, about 90% if I'm making over like $450,000. Uh, oh, yes. It's, taxes were very high. Yes. And so if I have the ability to say, okay, I'm making $460,000 or, or I'm making, let's say, $500,000, I don't want that $50,000 to be taxed at a 90% marginal rate. So I'm going to attribute 250,000 to me and 250,000 to right. um, Mrs. My Sam spouse. Singer That's is right. what I would have called her at the time. And, um, and therefore I'm not subjected to that 90% tax rate. So, okay. So I get that part and I get then, 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 and Congress makes that fix, but why does that implicate your parents? Uh, so first of all, in 1948, we know from research that white couples were way more likely to be in single wage earner households than black couples, even in 1948. So in 1948, if anybody was paying attention and nobody was, think about 1948, it was before Brown v. Board, a vet, it was before Civil right. Rights Act. People were not thinking about black equality, right? So, but even in 1948, we knew married black couples would not be getting the tax cuts the way married white couples were. But who was also upset that the Henry Seaborns of the world got a tax cut? The single Henrys of the world. So let's look at single Henry who makes 100,000 and married Henry who makes 100,000. Married Henry pays less in taxes because he has a married filing jointly rate schedule that gives him a tax cut. Well, single Henry was not happy and single Henry lobbied Congress. So in 1969, they changed the code once more whereby single Henry paid higher taxes, but not significantly higher, which meant the marriage bonus was decreased for the Seaborns. The singles penalty was decreased for the single Henrys, but married couples with dual equal earning wage earners paid higher taxes. That was the outcome of the rate schedule change in 1969. So from that point on, people like my parents, when they got married, they paid higher taxes. And so, and, and, and of course, the reason why, I mean, uh, there, there are probably many reasons why you have a situation where that dynamic exists, where white people um, are, have a higher propensity to have a single breadwinner or a, uh, yes. a breadwinner who is significantly more winning more bread than the yes. other because we had, well, first off, there's not the ceiling that existed uh, for black people and probably still exists, frankly, in terms of how much money. There's just a lot more white people have the opportunity to make a lot more money yes. than a uh, black, in, at that time, yes. male ha- head of household. And so both uh, members uh, of that couple would have to work because right. neither one of them has the earning potential uh, particularly then, but I would argue probably now as well Absolutely. in the same way uh, to make, you know, extraordinary sums of money that you'd want to dish off to your, to your, to your spouse. Um, all right. So what, and, and so are there other penalties within the context of marriage? Cause I want to go through some of the other sort of like silos in which the right. tax code punishes, um, you know, wittingly or unwittingly sort of irrelevant in terms of the implications, uh, um, but um, uh, black people. So is that it for uh, marriage? 
I would say yes, but I will just point out one thing. Over time, more white couples were facing the marriage penalty. So I believe the reason why the Trump tax cuts minimized the marriage penalty was because more and more married white couples were facing it. Oh, that's fascinating. And how right. does that, I mean, I mean, I, it, 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 when you say it, it makes total sense to me that that would be the case. But I mean, how do you see that manifest? Like, I, does that just simply like, I, I, are, are people just sort of looking at like, okay, here's our, here's our, uh, our constituency. Um, how can we give them tax relief? And it just so happens, I mean, when the Republicans look at their constituency, they don't have to say like, should we um, uh, advantage white people or black people? They're looking at their constituency. Right. And so it's like, well, of course it's gonna advantage white people because 93% of our <laughs> right. voters are white people. Right, right. So, you know, there, research shows we still have a majority of white married couples getting the marriage bonus but it's a significant minority of married white couples who are paying the penalty. So there are more and more um, white couples paying the penalty, which is why I believe you saw the Trump tax cuts. But let me just say for low income workers who are eligible for the earn income tax credit, there was no marriage penalty relief in the Trump tax cuts, none. So at the very high end, at the very low end, there was no marriage penalty relief. Interesting. All right. Well, let's move on to yes. education. Yes. Uh, because there's a there's another dynamic here. Uh, tell us about that. So in education, it's about how people pay for college and how people pay for college in the black community is very different than in the white community. In the white community, you you may have grandma or parent who pays for your college, which leads, and, and the same is not true in the black community, which leads to black college graduates leaving with more student debt. And the only tax relief we give for student debt is up to $2,500 of interest, which I did the math, doesn't allow black college graduates to deduct all their interest in the early years because their debt is too great. Wow. So we see that, you know, everybody says, or people think, oh, college is this great equalizer. Well, no, it isn't because black Americans experience college very different than their white peers. Uh, for the first, 60% of black students who start college don't graduate. So most people leave college with debt, but no ability to get a better paying job to amortize that debt. And then over time, the debt grows, either because of income-based repayment, either because black students are more likely to go to graduate school when we graduate. So we've got more debt that we are stacking on. And research shows even wealthy black parents cannot protect their students from debt the way wealthy white parents can. Uh, so there's a couple of things. So essentially, um, college is more expensive for black people. It's exactly. basically just like that's that's that, that's it. I would imagine the incidence of graduate degrees is higher because um, black people are more conscious of the headwinds that they're facing when they go into the uh, career uh, path. And so they feel that they need to have more, um, you know, uh, bona fides uh, to deal in, which I would imagine is also uh, the case. Absolutely. Um, and we should also say that the 529 yes is a would also have the same effect but on the front side correct yes and you see more white americans i mean an overwhelmingly amount of white americans who have or, or those who have 529s and very few black americans can afford to put money away why cuz we're paying extra taxes why because we're sending home money to parents and or uh, siblings because of Jim Crow, because there's no safety net, because the wealth disparities uh, prevent Black Americans from building wealth, much less handing it down. So you, you take two Black workers with the same income level, that's like suspend disbelief and you know work with me on this hypo. Right. The Black worker has more demands on their dollars than the white worker. 
which is sending money to parents. Whereas research shows white college graduates are more likely to get money from their parents and grandparents and use it for further wealth building. 